Okay, uh, so today's topic, by the way, somebody prepared, I don't know who, maybe you, prepared a wonderful, wonderful uh, um, poster for this, for this talk. That was, that was great. <laughs> I think it was like uh, art and science together and really showing the essence and you know, the, the, the soul of what I'm trying to achieve. I'm trying to achieve, I'm trying to achieve the, uh, um, the solution for static electricity. I'm trying to find the solution for static electricity remotely by light. And you're going to see that this is something that is kind of important. And this is why I'm, I'm hopefully important and I'm doing this. I'm dedicating my life, my 24 hours to this. Okay, um, yeah, so what is static electricity? We will start from static electricity and what we are going to do is we are going to see the mitigation mechanisms. Okay, so how we can dissipate charges quickly on common polymers, which is a big issue, very big issue. Billions of dollars are lost in this, in the industry, in everyday applications. So this is what I'm going to show you. And I'm going to get into the details of this uh, paper with the Yoda, where we are uh, removing charges by uh, illuminating with a laser light. Okay, and I'm going to show you a movie of this one. Um, but before that, I would like to thank people who have actually done the work. And these are these guys here, the big head and the small heads. Okay, so this is uh, the Bitekin group, current members. And most of the work that I will show you is actually from the old members, especially the Nature Com paper, because it was published in 2019. But we are pursuing on this subject because it's so interesting. And it was the first time uh, in uh, 2019 in the literature that uh, light controlled static charging in common polymers was reported. So we we are the ones who are actually pursuing this interesting idea. So in our group, actually, we are doing many, many things in parallel uh, because my star sign is Gemini. Okay, so we ha I have to do that. It is our budget. I have to do many things at the same time and uh, you know, be try to become successful in all, but I don't know <laughs> what is the percent of success in these. But anyway, we are trying to pursue all these uh, questions in mechanochemistry, static electricity, and soft robots. They seem to be quite detached from each other, topic-wise, but they have these intersections where things get really interesting. For example, today I'm going to talk about static electricity. It has so much to do with mechanochemistry, bond breaking by mechanical action. Okay, and you see the current members of our group? And you see the old members of our group, funding sources, okay? And uh, most of this research is funded uh, by actually by taking funds, especially the Nature Com paper. We didn't have the project, the Tupida project yet when we started this uh, in our laboratory. And I had an undergrad student who was willing to do, who was willing to do all this counting of the beads that I'm going to show you. So I'm very grateful uh, to that student, which I will show you uh, yeah, for, uh, for uh, whom we, we are, uh, you know, whose results I'm going to present. Okay, so static electricity. Yes, it is the one that you know from the primary school, from your everyday experience. This is my daughter. This is my daughter, Aicha. Mm -hmm. She was about five, six years when this photo was taken. She has grown up to eight years now. But still, the hair still looks like the same. Okay, so this is the, the photo uh, taken after she used the playground. And in the playgrounds, usually we have these gadgets, the toys. They're all made up of plastic. And when you just light, or when you just you know, swing, what you get is static electricity, and she's happy with it. Right? Static electricity is just like a kid's play. It's fine, you know, it's just an interesting phenomenon. You can see that in all science museums, in science uh, facilities for public, 
they have these, uh, you know, wonder graph generator generating static electricity and people get their hairs up and they get funny photos and so on. This is fun. This is fun for us in our everyday life. Uh, it's an interesting thing and sometimes only annoying when you have your you know, feet on the carpet and try to hold the doorknob. And there's a sh little shock, right? That's, that's all. That's all uh, that is annoying about static electricity in everyday life. But in industry or in other respects, static electricity can be a pain in the ass. It can be because most of the things that we work with are insulators, whether solids or liquids. They are insulators. And the insulators, when they come into contact with each other, they get charged. This is what static electricity is about. When you touch surfaces, when I just touch here, I leave my static electricity handprint because all touches to insulator objects would just cause them acquire charges. And these charges can be really detrimental. It can, they can be very huge, kilowatts, hundreds of kilowatts. We are talking about that kind of electric potential. Luckily, they are mostly localized, so they don't you know, generate, uh, you, don't, you don't have large surfaces in your everyday life. But if you are working in industry, you're generating huge polymer sheets, for example, then that is a big problem. It's a problem also in electronics, in, in space industries. They are trying to prevent the little sparks that may occur when you send your satellite to space. Okay? <laughs> I mean, what happens when you do, when you have static charging in your satellite in space? You cannot ground it, right? You cannot ground the charges. So you have to find a way to mitigate charges or make the whole overall potential equal in every part of your instrument, every part of your satellite. And this was, uh, yeah, this was when they just uh, sent a satellite, Galaxy 15, and after, so shortly after the launch, the buildup of static electricity you know, broke some of the important electronic circuits, and it was just that. Millions of dollars okay, went to waste. And what about this one? Do you know what, is, what this is? Hindenburg. Hindenburg. What is this, did it? Zeppelin. 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 Do you watch French? Or did you watch French? Yeah. In the French and in the other universe, we, they had the Zeppelins because probably they didn't have the Hindenburg. Just shortly after the Hindenburg disaster, which was caused by static electricity, and the hydrogen exploded because of the sparks of static electricity, Zeppelin business just went down in our universe. In the other universe, in French, they still had the Zeppelin thing. Um, right, so but you, can, you may say, the Hojan, this is so old, 1937. Okay, let's come to more recent and probably more important disasters, for example, Jim Beam. Jim Beam fire, uh, 45,000 barrels. They were just, I mean, released or they were burned because of the fire that destroyed the, the plant, the bourbon plant in, uh, in Kentucky. That's a, that's a big thing. Uh, the, the, um, quite expensive um, disaster, of course. And then, um, so it, it, it may be in these uh, particular places where we have the uh, electrostatic um, discharging, causing fire sparks and fires of things which can burn very easily. And one thing that I would like to show you is, a uh, uh, thing in the gasoline stations, for example, you can have, in the gas stations, you can have that kind of fires, so you should be careful. But before that, I would like to show you one thing that I found very recently. Okay. So this would be a fire in a very typical uh, chemical, um, you know, it's a transfer station probably, in a, in a factory. It doesn't matter what we have inside. It's usually the insulator materials. 
you know, when I say insulator, it's a very broad range of materials. I'm not talking about conductors, then I'm talking about insulators. So this, uh, in this one, he's just transferring a liquid. And this guy, and here is a pipe. So he's transferring the liquid into a pipe, any kind of liquid. It can be petroleum, it can be hexane, deacetylator, any kinds that you can imagine. And now there's a spark. And look how quickly it will burn. As I talk, it, it will burn down almost completely because of the flame, wa uh, flammable vapors. The, uh, the surrounding is already filled up with these vapors. When you have the spark, it starts to burn immediately. So this can happen when you have flammable liquids, the transfer of petroleum products. Okay, it's a very, very big industrial area you have to think about millions of tons of of or gallons of these products okay i cannot f watch further it's it's a tragedy uh, luckily the man at at least um you know got he, he escaped before it got terrible okay so one thing I would like to make sure that, especially when we, when we are in winter, in Ankara, we can get a lot of static charging. My polyester, polar, okay, gets charging very quickly. So this can happen as you're getting in and out of your car. When you hold the uh, doorknob, door handle, you feel it, right? Or you're getting on a bus. When you hold the, the metal uh, handles, you, you, hear, uh, you feel the shock. Uh, one thing to prevent this type of, for example, things in the oil stations or when the flammable liquids are around is just to ground yourself. Okay, this is grounding yourself before holding any kind of, or getting near the gas stations like that or getting a flammable liquid, getting near the flammable liquids. So I hope, I mean, not only for the flammable liquids, flammable gases in pharmaceutical industry it's a big problem too because we have the powders and they want to make it for example pellets of powders and powders are getting charged and then in paper industry it's a big problem too because you're make, trying to make the paper but paper gets charged and you cannot roll it in polymer industry it's also uh, 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 it can cause disaster for example there's a I, as far as I remember, in 1969, the whole plant burned down, the polypropylene plant burned down because of a single shock, a single electrical shock. There are ways to prevent this. In all cases, the idea is to ground yourself or ground whatever you have. So transfer of liquids, they usually have the grounding between the, the two ends of the transfer area. Uh, helicopters, for example, before they land, they just try to ground themselves because in air they can also get static charges. It's a one like empirical way to prevent these charges. But in order to prevent, for example, pharmaceutical powders, different kinds of polymers, the common polymers that we use, we need something more systematic, not just you know, touching things. You cannot ground everywhere and every single powder piece. You have to have something more, more systematical. Okay, this is what we are trying to achieve. Okay, is it getting interesting? Okay, so this is what we are trying to do. I just open all of them so that we can talk about. So we try to find the mechanism of static electricity. What the hell is going on on the surfaces when the materials get touched, okay, when they touch each other? This is what we are trying to do. So I'm going to talk about these two science papers. Okay, these two science papers. Oh, I forgot that we are recording. Maybe I shouldn't do any shebeking anymore. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about the prevention of static charges, how we can mitigate those, thinking about the mechanism. How, we, how the charges may, might be forming. And believe me, I'm not going to tell the final result because the final thing about the mechanism of static electricity 
is unclear, was unclear before we started, is unclear yet, and then it will be probably unclear in the future too because it's so complicated what is happening on the surfaces. We have different roughnesses, different chemistries, uh, we have different events at different magnification levels, okay, macroscopic level, uh, microscopic level, and then at nano level, we have many, many different things happening. So, and they all affect each other. So it might be very hard to find out a single mechanism, but I'm going to show you at least what we think might be dominating in the common polymers that we have. Yeah, so the prevention of static charge is something that we really, I'm really obsessed with. And contact charging, we would like to also get it into the energy. We can, we can you know, develop energy by rubbing the surfaces. And this is usually called as uh, triboelectric uh, energy generation. Tribo is rubbing friction, so you rub things and you get energy. It's a funny thing, but yeah, this is how many people are uh, engaged in getting the energy from electrification, static electrification. That's the triboelectric generators. And yes, friction has a lot of, a lot of uh, things which are common with static electricity, not that uh, by the friction, not only that the friction causes static electricity, but also uh, you can see that, you can um, find out that if you try to remove static charges on surfaces by some means, for example this one, uh, a motor shaft does not get warm, so the friction is reduced. So they sort of have this interplay. Friction causes static charges, and more static charging will cause the friction to be higher. We have a very interesting movie here, if you're interested in this one, it is this paper here, Science Advances, which shows that you can even stop motors with uh, light polymer pieces rubbing each other and the static charging stops the motor because of the high friction between the rubbing elements. Okay, so there is a lot of things that are also to be discovered in that area too. Preventing electrostatic charges, how, do we, how can we do that? One way is to increase humidity because we know that uh, in the humid environment, we don't have much charging. It's a common phenomenon, it's a, something that we experience. The other thing is, okay, humidity increase might not work very well with electronics, for example. You cannot spray your electronics with water. It would be not so beneficial for the electronics functioning. So, one other thing is conductivity increase. This either, it, I mean, it doesn't work very well with the electronics either, so it's, it, it is a, a, not a universal solution. But at least to prevent some of the sparks, for example, you can see this packaging. This is why I brought this one. This is my Arduino set. So look at this packaging here. This is made up of probably poly, you know, polyprotein. And you see that it's mostly actually metallized looks like a metal, because there is metal particle doped in this packaging in order to prevent the charge buildup, which would harm the uh, delicate uh, electronics inside. So one, one way to prevent charges in common polymers is to dope it with metals, which would not make much sense, for example, for conforming coatings of electronics. If you want to coat your electronics, if you want to use this in a satellite, because it will cause short circuiting of your electronics, just like the humidity increase. So uh, another thing is that as you can figure out here the mechanical properties and the optical properties, because this is not transparent anymore, they are affected by this doping too. And in order to get the conductivity increase, you have to dope with very high amounts. 30%, 40%, so you don't have polymer, but a polymer metal uh, composite in the end, with very high dopings of your metal. So in most cases, these are good, but they are not enough, especially for electronics and other uses. 
But in order to find out new methods, we are, what we are trying to do, new methods, we have to, as I mentioned, find out the, uh, the reason for static electricity. Why is it taking place? Hocam, I know how it is taking place, değil mi? Everybody knows from the primary school, you wrap two things. You wrap the ebony thing to the silk. Okay. Okay, like this. And you get things charged. And what is shown in the book is that you have an electron transfer from this one or this one to the other one. An arrow and an electron on it with a minus charge. Okay, when I look into this mechanism, I see one very big incorrect thing, okay? So one big failure, that insulators do not have free electrons to transfer, to be transferred, right? Insulators have all the electrons localized in their chemical bonds. Not unlike the metals, metals can donate their electrons to the crystal, so we have free electrons, but insulators don't. They don't have free electrons. Where is the free electron coming? And if you look down at the uh, you know, potentials, electric potentials that are created, it can't be anything, any electron that is trapped in the structure or anything like that. It has to be a huge number of electrons transferred at once. And this doesn't really make sense, although it's still <laughs> taught as the main mechanism, electron transfer mechanism. So, sole electron transfer is not viable, is not plausible, because of this reason that insulators do not have free electrons roaming in their structure. Okay, it's, it's, always, say, it's always easy to say it's not this, it's not that, then what is it? That's a, that's a different thing to, you know, propose. We have to propose another mechanism for this charging. For iron bearing polymers, we have the iron transfer. It's easy. It's published. White size has published it. It's very easy. But for all those polyethylene, polypropylene, all these polymers with, without any ions, with, which have just carbon and hydrogen as atoms and covalent bonds, what might be the transfer? So this is what I'm looking at. And when I started this during my postdoc, uh, I went into the literature, and this is what you should do all the time when you try to make research on things. You have to figure out what people have done before you to, to uh, have at least a starting point. And this was my starting point. Look at this one, three-ball electric series. Everybody's talking about three-ball electric series, and this is somehow like an electrochemical series but it's more like an empirical one. So what they do is they wrap things together, they have these pairs, and they figure out which material gets more negative charge and which material gets more positive charge. For example, human hair, my hair in the morning gets electrified. <laughs> this is why I have this bun most of the time in winter. So it gets positively charged. If you come with an electrometer or any kind of electrostatic measurement device, you will find out your air is positively charged. Most of the synthetic polymers are negatively charged. Here's my favorite, Teflon, my personal favorite, PVC. So you look at those, they are all negatively charged. Again, there exists a problem. Of course, the polymers are not just, just the name. Their surface change a lot. Their coatings change a lot. Their roughness change a lot. And then there are additives. There are number of cross links, crystallinity, and all of these embedded in the polymer behavior. They affect the polymer behavior. So you can have things changing very quickly in this list. And there are many, many triboelectric series which claim that theirs is the best because they have measured this in this, this condition and that condition, but you know, there is no real explanation to all, all of this. Huh? I just, okay, done. Is yours serious? No, it's not my serious. I don't believe in tribolytic serious. It's like a unicorn. I think it should not exist. Yeah, I mean, we just refuted that 
this idea of triboelectric series in this paper. That's, that's my paper. Uh, Angevin Tech Chemistry, 2012. We just rubbed things together and we figured out that material transfer between the surfaces occur. So you cannot really identify your pure material after the rubbing and the material which is transferred is the one that is charged. So it is just you know, getting more complicated as we get material transfer, and that is in most of the cases we have that. Okay, and these are the things in the triple electric series from rabbit fur, nylon. That that was my head. I actually I miss it. I somehow uh, lost it somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> my head in Chicago. Okay, so okay. Again, I'm telling you that this is not the mechanism. This is not the way to look into this series. But what is the mechanism then? Okay, so looking at the literature, I found this article from Troy Schimbrot. Troy Schimbrot is a, is a genius. It's a, he's a very interesting personality. And he works on many things. And one of the things that he works is the electrostatics. And in his paper in EPL Journal, he said that the balloons, because static electricity is all about balloons, right? And you say static electricity is all about like rubbing balloons and putting them on the wall, electrostatic attraction, and they don't fall. Well, here, electrostatic charging. So he said that, yes, we have charging of balloons, but balloons do not charge homogeneously negative or homogeneously positive. They have these regions where we have the electrostatic charges, positive and negative. And some of the places he died with a, a dye which is uh, attracted to the negative side of the balloon. So you can see that not all of the balloon is covered with the dye, and the rest of the places probably had a reverse sign of charge. So we have both positive and negative charges on the same material. That's very controversial because we think that, okay, things should get either positively charged or negatively charged as we rub them together. Okay, and this one is pretty mind-blowing because why should the balloon should get positive and negative? And again, if it was an electron transfer, it should be giving electron and taking electron at the same time, which doesn't make sense. Okay. So that's kind of interesting, and there is a, actually a movie here, but I don't want to show you. So um, it's simply describing that the balloon, the two sides are repelling each other, and two other sides, two other pairs of locations are attracting each other. So we worked on this with Aicha. Uh, she showed me how to work with balloons. This is how she's showing me how to work with balloons because you know she's an expert in balloons, definitely. And uh, yeah, she said that, well, maybe we should get, maybe Dr. Weitigen, I don't know. Okay, Dr. Weitigen, we should get a closer look because we don't know what is happening on the surface. Why don't you get a closer look into this? So this is how she's getting closer look. Or, I mean, a macroscopic look may not really show you the object, so here's a microscopic one. Okay, we should really get a magnification, a really huge magnification of things. Okay, so this is how we should look into the surfaces. What is happening here on this surface? What is happening here on my coat? We should get into deeper, deeper magnification, more magnification so that we can understand what is going on. And this was the starting point of our study. Magnification. We used an atomic force microscope, which can give us a magnification up to hundreds of nanometers of domains on the surface. And this special mic uh, microscope did not only show the height, because AFM is usually uh, you know, taken, uh, used for taking height images of the surfaces by topological map at very small uh, dimensions of the surface, like micron, 
So for example, here it's 0 to 4.5 microns across. Uh, this one that we worked with was a state-of-the-art instrument at that time, and it had this wonderful modality which is called the Calvin Probe Force Microscopy. So not only we are measuring the height on the surface, but we can measure the electrostatic potential on the surface and map it. So the negative parts, the darker parts have negative charges, and the lighter parts have positive charges. This was the first picture of mosaic of compact electrification, and that's why it was published in Science at that time, uh, a decade ago. So you can see that any polymer which is not touched does not have any electric potential, but the potential gets rougher, so we have more charges, positive and negative, when things are touched to each other, and this is the same material touching each other. So again, one more time, repeating the solely electron transfer mechanism, because if we have an electron transfer mechanism, we should be having some sort of you know, unidirectional transfer. We have to have one electron from one side to another, but now we have electrons on both sides, if they are electrons. Okay, so heterotouching, uh, yes? Uh, does it come back to the initial state when we ground the polymer? Yes, it turns the initial state, the upper one, when you ground the polymer, when you wait long enough. Long enough means for PBMS it's about uh, 30 minutes, and of course depending on the relative humidity. So the roughness is just gone after uh, you wait for a long time. And the dissipation of charges are locally, so it's just the, the it's not getting like um, like it's not roaming around specially, but it's decaying at its own place. Something that I don't understand either. There are lots of things that are still uncovered about this. Okay, looking at this, huh, Andri, you were going to ask something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe expect that the area covered by pink mm -hmm. is equal to area covered by blue. Uh, they did not. I, I actually asked uh, Troy about this later on. Uh, he said that they did not study this. At that point, they so were just interested. The, in total charge. The thing is that when you, um, it's an actually very good question, which was the next thing that I would like to show but you. Here you have this chess-like. Exactly, chessboard-like thing. It should be question it large number of white cells equivalent to number of. <laughs> not exactly. They are not exactly equal to each other, and uh, at these depths, for example. The charge density is so high, much, much higher, like three orders, four orders of magnitude higher than what we measure from a microscopic object. So we have lots of energy buried in there, which we can't use. But still, we have to dig in. I don't know how to, how to get that energy over there. But they add up to, usually they add up to um, an excess of small excess of charge, either positive or negative. Again, I don't know how the trend is being made here. But identical materials can get charged, so things can get both positive and negative charge. That's pretty interesting. And since uh, Tarek, the other author, actually this by taking is Tarek, not me. <laughs> so uh, Tarek proposed that maybe we should just look into the surfaces in idea of bond breaking mechanism. And this is something that was known at that time, it's mechanochemistry of polymer. So you break the polymer, you can form ends by breaking the covalent bonds here, carbon-carbon bonds, you can form cations, anions, and radicals. So these are charged species. And probably at the very late night, uh, after getting drunk, we thought that maybe these are the charges on the surfaces. We don't really have electrons, but these are the things that we see in the KFM images. And that started to make sense after a couple of, as I mentioned, beers. And he said that that's, that's a very interesting one. I said, then maybe 
the radicals are also playing a role because, okay, the radicals are neutral, but maybe if we remove them, we would get less charging or maybe we get a better picture just seeing the cations and anions in the domains. So we didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but we tried this experiment where we removed the radicals from the surface by doping the polymer with some additive. And this additive is, interestingly, it's, it's called alpha tocopherol. It's vitamin E. So we mixed the polymer with vitamin E. <laughs> we were allowed to do the, these kind of things in the lab. Okay, the, the boss was not coming very frequently to the lab, so okay, the underground projects. Okay, then we figured out that, yes, there should be an in interesting thing. Um, we figured out that the charge decays so fast on these polymers where we had vitamin E included. And the doping amount was so low, you cannot imagine. Probably this is like 20% of metal, but we had to use just 1% of the weight, just one drop of vitamin E mixed into the polymer, and we get the discharging. So I don't want to get into the chemistry. Molecular biology people would probably not like it. Huh? Do you like chemistry? Oh, God. Bizarre. <laughs> okay, so any kind of like chemical treatment that would remove radicals from the surface looks like we are having a mitigation of charges, elimination of charges from the polymers. And our polymer is still insulator because we didn't dope anything conductive. It's very interesting. Usually, anesthetic materials are set to as, there's a ranking like this, surface resistivity is ranking. So if the, you increase the conductivity, you get anesthetic material. But we don't need to do that. We have some material now, which is insulating and anesthetic at the same time. So we did not change any electrical property. So, Tarek had this nice idea, and he tried this in electronic circuits. So here is a trans, uh, transistor that is covered by our strange material, which is dark, with the radical scavenger DPPH. And you can see that this transistor is the only one which is working under high influence of static charges, okay? electric potential. The, all the others are just gone. After a while, they don't give any signal, but this one is getting on and off, on and off as we spray charges on it. So we can prevent things with, by additives that, are, that is sort of based on the chemical mechanism that we proposed initially looking at this KFM image. So that was nice because we also got, got a patent for this and uh, sort of made our way to Turkey. When I came, when I started here, I was thinking about, okay, maybe we should go for more natural products because this tocopherol, it's one grand, $200, which is not very you know, feasible to use in the industry. So you cannot just you know, take a tocopherol and make electronic coatings. So I went on trying to extract lignin from nutshell yeah, because we have a nutshell farm it wasn't hard. We had the feedstock for, for free. So we extracted lignin. I'm going to show you what uh, the results of this in the last slide. What I'm going to show you is rather this one, what you were waiting for. Okay, now, how can we actually act to remove static charges remotely? So far, we have just put everything inside the polymer. Okay, and we had to charge it, and we made the antistatic material, which was permanently antistatic all the time. But right now, we want something that becomes antistatic when we shine light on it. And that would be very practical, right? So because in the industry, you can just you know, sit on a place and you can just shoot a laser remotely, or you can just turn on the lights somewhere to remove the charges on the uh, statically charging surfaces. And we can also manipulate objects um, in this method. So this is what I'm going to show you, the nice talk picture. Huh. So 
In order to do that, we used something that we serendipitously found. Again, you see what I'm, what I'm telling you? I'm telling you to play in the lab. Play in the lab to find things uh, which are interesting and which are uh, you know, exciting to pursue. So this is what we were doing. We, we have these polymer balls in our vial and we were playing with them because the sound is so nice. Okay. And we were playing like fools and then we figured out that these balls, because they are so light, when they are charged by mechanical agitation, they stick to the walls of the vial. You can know this already, but maybe you can pass it on so that people can play with them and see the charging. Okay, that's pretty interesting and that was something that like the Palmer balls getting attracted to the walls of the glass vial. Um, we had this crazy idea because both Tariq and me, we were, um, we had a background in organic chemistry, actually supramolecular chemistry with the dyes, organic dyes. So we said that, okay, let's put a solution inside the vial. This is what vials are for, okay, putting solutions inside. And this solution shall contain uh, an organic dye. Because we had some organic dyes in the lab and we were playing. And we had this idea, let's go and uh, shine UV light on it and what will happen to it. Again, too much alcohol okay. during this experiment, probably. OK, and this is uh, the repetition of this experiment that we did. And now it's not my hand, it's Doruk's hand who did this experiment as an undergraduate student, uh, second year, at the start of the study. So what, is, what he is doing is he's doing this more systematically with a, with a vortexer. Okay? The time of shaking, vortexing is measured. And you can see that the beads stick on the walls like a profi, okay? A professional electrostatic interaction all over. And they do not they do not fall down because the electrostatic interaction between the wall and the glass is so strong, so strong that it overcomes the gravity, the, the weight of the beads. Okay. Then this is what we did next. Okay, put the two wires, one with the dye one without the dye, on a UV lamp. Here is the UV lamp that you cannot see exactly, but I hope you can understand it because this dye is flourishing in the uh, vial where uh, it is present. And we saw that the, the, the beads are slowly heading to the ground. So the electrostatic interactions are ceased. Okay, no more electrostatics, more gravity taking uh, care of the beads. And on the other one, which is illuminated, but there's no dye, identically prepared, we do not have any discharge, any falling of the beads. Okay, if you see such a thing in the lab, what do you do? As chemists, as engineers, ask the lot what you do. You're a, you're a physics student. Yeah. Uh -huh. What do you what? I do when I see the beads? Uh -huh. Yes, what would you do if you see such a thing? This is, this is something interesting, right? Yeah. Maybe I go to give energy and then mm. to... Okay, but would you like to repeat this observation first? Because maybe you had a mistake while you were preparing the sample. Mm. Maybe you had some yeah. water in the vial where we had the dye. Okay, we, maybe you had a systematic error somewhere, right? Maybe put it on Instagram and collect like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the, um, you repeat it, right? You repeat it with different number of beads, the different solutions, different vials, to see whether this is really happening, for God's sake. Okay, so this is what Doruk and Atakan did. They worked with thousands of beads in order to get statistics about this. 
whether this is real thing that we see discharging in presence of dyes. Oh, you can change the dye concentration to see the effect of dye, right? Scientific method, huh? Scientific method. Scientific method kills. We can say that. Scientific method kills, right? It kills. Because you have to do all of these things. Okay, so this is what later on he did. He did statistics on all of these and figured out that only with dye, which is called kumarin, these dyes always have shiki miki names, okay? and under UV light, we have fast discharging of beads at earlier times. So the number of beads discharged is more at earlier times. And in all, all other cases, where there's no light, where there's no dye, where there are no beads, okay, so of course that's not the case, but you know, we have very slow discharge. Okay. And then with concentration, increasing the concentration, increase the rate of discharging, which is also telling us that, okay, dye is mediating this process. Dye has a role in this process, definitely. Taking this organic dye in the solution, we have a sort of an you know, effect of the uh, fast dis dissipation of charges. Okay, different kind of beads. Works with different kinds of beads. The beads can get overall negatively or positively charged. So the overall charge on the beads, teflon, polypropylene, nylon, polyoxymethylene, Regardless of how they are charging, we have, again, the same type of qualitatively, the same type of behavior. <laughs> Look what they have. This, this is like the statistics, the third beat. Atakan got blind, probably, after, after uh, all these videos that he had to watch. Because you cannot do this digitally. He had to watch and record the falling time of each beat yeah, in the know. video. Exactly. One by one. One by one. Bunu yapan kör oldu. Var ya, hakikaten bunu yapan kör oldu yani. Yaptı çocuk. Doğruk da çok çalıştı ikisi de birden. They did this very diligently. And yes, if the, there is a dye, then we should also use the chemistry, okay, absorption, emission spectra. So we figured out that only when you excite the dye at the proper wavelength, we have the light uh, effect. So visible uh, absorbing dyes would cause the dissipation under visible light. The UV absorbing dyes would cause dissipation under UV light. Okay, as you have completed all of these, okay, so you have all these parameters studied and you have verified the phenomenon, what do you do? You still wonder how this is taking place, right? How, how? So in the beginning, we said, okay, there should be an electron transfer to the excited dye. When I say this, the molecular biology people will say, oh, Hoca is going into the photophysical things. Okay. I'm not really getting into that photophysical things because that was not the mechanism. In the end, we proposed the mechanism based on dipole. So this is for the chemistry loving people. Dipole uh, changes. But still, there's a lot, as I mentioned, this was just the first study, so there's a lot to discover here. Again, with the different dyes and their dipole moments. And finally, in order to make this useful, you know, in industry people not using solutions to dissipate charges, so we dope the dyes into solid polymers, and if you shine light on solid polymers, you get faster charge dissipation, which is something that is really cool. I, mean, I still like it after three years, so this is nice. Okay, and the movie for this, Yoda thing, I'll just show you. So this is the uh, electrostatic assembly of the small bees that you have in the end, in, in your hands. They are charged and they cluster together with electrostatic forces. In the solution with dyes, it's dark, so you cannot see that, but there's a solution of the dye, and we are illuminating at some position with uh, just a handheld UV laser. Okay, Doruk had all of these lasers in him, on his keychain. So he's using this laser. So you'll see that the assembly will soon lose its charge and it will detach. This is one of the things that you can use to manipulate um, micro objects from distance. 
it has also be that's also something that might be useful for soft robotics, my other research area. Okay, so is it the only example where we have electrostatic charge dissipation with light? No, of course. When you see such a thing, which is interesting and nobody had done before, what do you do? You try to do more. Okay, so you try to do more, and this is what we did. We and did there was more. The previous before you coming for this new interesting example. Uh, uh, no, this is just a very interesting, uh, intriguing stuff that, that mm -hmm. is later one may manipulate. Mm -hmm. I'm just guessing what if the house would not be made of glass but of plastic or of uh, quartz? Uh, quartz, we. I mean, if uh, the. Uh -huh. Walls uh -huh. would be made of different materials mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. this is kind of systematic stuff. We, because you've been studying everything inside, exactly. But we are was uh -huh. particular. Uh -huh. Apart it, it, that it absorbs light, yes, by itself, yes. But uh -huh. also the surface property, uh -huh. how it exchanges charges, is different. And if you and take we, a series of uh, transparent vials made of something else, mm -hmm. we try to actually coat the inner surface of the vials with okay. some. Uh, layers of other materials and they worked qualitatively the same so there was no exciting result but it's definitely interesting exactly I mean we, here we have charged the uh, uh, polymers with polymer glass interaction but you can also have higher charges with polymer polymer interaction <coughs> which is known to have uh, known to create higher amount of charges and you can have positive, negative charging. You can you can have a lot of things actually, lots of parameters. Because it's like have a set of this optical reusable one you mm -hmm. want to use uh, cells for mm -hmm. uh, optical measurements mm -hmm. of the set, so mm -hmm. they can be used as a matrix for trial. Exactly. Like that. Exactly. So we can have again. I mean, this this was just like to show you show the communication. It's it's just to communicate people that such a phenomenon exists. But there is a lot to be studied here. And there was only one, for example, solid polymer. You can you have to extend it to uh, different types of polymers, thermoplastics, and so on, in order to study the mechanism. And we just tentatively proposed this mechanism of dipoles taking uh, some help from computational people. And those computational people helped us a lot to design something in which, so the previous example, we were all making off on and on with light. And here we can tune the rate at which we dissipate charges. Again, a different chemistry thing. This time, more like MOSFETs. Okay, we are just putting some salt some crystals, it's not exactly salt, but some crystals into the polymer, dopingly it into the polymer, and again, the trick is done with light. So you can eliminate the charges at the rates that you would like to have. Okay, what does it do? I mean, what is it good for? I don't know yet, but this is something that we had recently done by changing the chemistry. It's more to understand the mechanism rather than the application. Uh, Cold meat, instead of dopamine. like only uh, the powder. Uh, during the contact, for example, it's just getting uh, removed. removed. Yes, it's polymer uh, surfaces usually are pretty sticky. Even if they are not sticky, they are removed and you cannot control the charge very well. But it should work. Even if it's on the surface, it should work very well. Okay, again, I mean, this doesn't show much. Look at this. All the, you know, statistics and wires and the balls and stuff like that. What I would say is, okay, look at the movies. So we can do with different substituents, amino and nitro, you know that, right? Have you taken organic chemistry? Yes. 2, 3, 3. Dönüş Hoca? Yes. Perfect. So Dönüş Hoca told you the amino substituents are more electron donating than nitro. So you see, for example, at the end, with the same time, we get more beads discharging than with nitro. Okay, so uh, nitro, there is no bead, 
no single movement, no eye blink of the beads at the same time. We can um, arrange the energy levels. Again, molecular orbital theory, huh? Homo lumo levels. And you can, um, you know, make sort of um, a control in the rate of discharging. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Homo levels. Did you learn molecular orbital theory a little bit? Okay, so you, uh, the molecules have uh, orbitals. You can say that they have orbitals similar to atomic orbitals. When atom, atoms combine to make molecules, you have new orbitals. And Homo is the one where you have the last electron. So you stop filling up according to the off bow, and this is the orbital with the energy of the last occupying electron. That's why it's called highest occupied molecular orbital. And this one, you can guess, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So it depends on where the electron is. The interaction with the crystal that we dope, which has these levels, and the charges is what we are looking for. So we try to, uh, you know, enlighten a mechanism of charge dissipation, and we are causing us, again, more problems. Because this one is a little bit different than the previous one. It shows that we can control, and there's definitely an electron transfer from polymer to the additive that we put. But again, okay, so a lot of questions have, uh, we have produced during the so it's not, again, a final thing. And as, as I mentioned, uh, we just discovered this phenomenon in 2019, so it has just been three years. Uh, we have to have more time in order to uh, discover all aspects. So I promised you, I think I'm, I'm sort of out of my time, but I promised to show you the lignin thing with the nut shells. Okay, nut shells. And this is the reason, actually, we figured out. It, it was a Jupiter project, by the way. Okay, so we, uh, th this was the reason with the lignin is why wood is not charging at all. When you have wood pieces, you rub them with any kind of material, they wouldn't get charged. They're always at the center of the trigonic series here. The empirical observation is that wood is not getting charged, although Cellulose, for example, gets charged very quickly. So you get cotton, you rub it around, it gets charged very quickly. But wood is not only cellulose. It has also the other polymer called lignin. So wood is a composite material. And the idea of this study was to get, first of all, to remove lignin from wood to see whether it's charging or not, and it was. Okay. Wood, lignin-free wood. And then we dope lignin into wood again. So you see that the charging is high when we have lignin-free wood. But then when we dope uh, wood with lignin again, we can get less charging. And we use the same idea just to dope our P polymers, synthetic polymers with lignin. So we dope lignin into the polymers, mixing them up at high temperatures where they are more liquidish. Okay, so where they, where they are like honey, uh, more viscous. And uh, we can have uh, antistatic polymers when we dope lignin inside our thermoplastic polymers. And the nice thing about this research is that you can, what you can do is, um, you can write the question as a title of your paper. And this is usually not very common, but this is, you know, what we're working on. Why does wood not get contact charged? And this is why wood does not get contact charged, because it has this polyphenol architecture, which can scavenge the radicals in the wood. Okay, so again, radical scavenging taking an action with the lignin doped into wood, naturally doped into wood. Nature did it already. Okay. Did you use this form of the lignin on the UV light? 
No, he did that. He did that because uh, uh, probably it would absorb in the volume region and uh, it would not be that useful in the sense that uh, most of the things that we are doing are uh, in the range of 350 nanometers, the lowest range. If you get higher with UV, like the energy, higher UV energy, lower wavelength, then you start breaking bonds photochemically, which is something that we wouldn't like to have. So I didn't try. You didn't try. I don't know. Yes, there's like but the, 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 there can be more pro uh, processes, more chemical processes accompanying the static charging with photochemical bond breakages. I ask that because the reason is because the luminous cell is that protected from the UV light. Exactly. Uh -huh. It absorbs light. This is actually a brown rock. It's a rock. If you make lignin, it doesn't dissolve in anything. It's a, it's a pain in the ass to just put it into another polymer, put it in the wood back again. So it's a hard thing to do, but we found some practical methods to get it inside the polymers. Um, so we can do it now for most of the polymers that we have, the common polymers that we have in everyday life, polyethylene, polypropylene, polyethylene terephthalate. Do you have water bottles? Good, okay. Don't, don't use the water bottles. Okay, if you're interested in this, I've written uh, the one with the Nature of Communications paper. I've written a short block. So if you want to remember what I've just uh, said today, Actually, we are recording, so you can also watch the whole thing again. But you can also get a summary of this. If you type nature chemistry community and if I take it in Google search, you get to this page where I have uh, you know, made a summary of this. Um, the first observations of contralimic static electricity by light. I will finish now. I think I've already gone, uh, taken too much time. Who is this? Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. And who is the guy? The little boy? I'm you don't know. <laughs> so I always thought it was with him. With only yeah. Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> they omitted his son. Actually, uh, this is just a, a, probably some drawing after Benjamin Franklin was dead. So it's just an imaginary thing. But it's known that he did this experiment together with his son probably much older than uh, the, you know, the depicted age here. Uh, and you know the idea, right? With the, it's one of the most common scientific stories. Uh, so the key holds the lightning, so it could prove that the clouds have electricity. So static electricity forms in the clouds. And my imagination, I just put, the lignin instead of the key. Okay, of course, this cannot be the case, but in order to prevent the charges, you can use lignin as additives. This is what I wanted to convey here as an idea. Okay, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
And we discussed also in this paper which ones are acting uh, more dominantly, more majorly in the action. Yeah, I didn't put the structure of tocopherol, but there's also a very similar structure. So if that worked, then this should also work, we said. But at that time, of course, we didn't know that this would turn out to be a rock and it would be like very hard to you know, put it into the polymers. We said that this is a good idea. Why don't we do it? And yeah, Fatma had a hard time putting it into the thermoplastics. Fatma Demir is the uh, equal first author in this paper. So they had really hard time with Matt John putting the lignin into the polymers. Okay, any more questions? Saçınızı tahta tarakla tararsanız daha az elektriklenir. There are uh, yeah, just like that. You can buy really wooden um, combs. Take on message. <laughs> Take on message bold. Yeah, and we're coming to